Special episode today. I'm getting to do something I've wanted to do for a long time. Introducing to you, introducing you to some of my friends, some of the folks that have been uh, teachers and mentors to me. I want to introduce you to Mark Adams. Uh, Mark and I have been friends for for years. Uh, Mark, decades. Decades. That's decades. true. It's, yeah. it's true. Uh, Mark has invited me uh, on some some pretty wild projects over the years. Uh, I've gotten to to do some pretty special things. Uh, I've gotten to learn some things I don't think I would have ever learned without without no. um, Mark. The latest one that we're working on uh, is a project for an art museum out in the Midwest. Uh, that's been a fantastic project. Today, I asked Mark to come in, and I asked him to come in because of the Ithaca uh, restoration project that I'm working on. I've got a, um, I've got to to glue up a couple cracks in this gunstock. Unlike the repair that I did a couple episodes back, this where the where the ear literally was separated from the the stock itself, the cracks that are left to deal with, we have these tiny cracks that are that are maybe four, five, eight, ten thousands at the most across. And I was asking Mark uh, one day here recently, what would be the best way to get in and clean out the residue, the oils that are in those cracks? Because I have to epoxy them together. I have to make these cracks literally disappear. And I need to, uh, I need to re replace the strength of, of the gun stock back to its original state so that when we assemble the gun and if somebody should decide they wanted to shoot it, sometime in the future, there's little or no chance of the, um, of the gun stock breaking or coming apart in the shooter's hands. With that said, Mark, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. I want you to tell me about this. I don't know a lot of the history, but what I do know is the family tells me that it was purchased new by their great-grandfather in 1905. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. And this gun stock, or this gun, has been in the family since then. And along the way, it's had a lot of history. Mm, um, I can see that. It's been, it's been used, well used. And there's, there was a, a shellac coating on it. We th I think it was shellac, uh, based on the, the, the way it's stripped. Mm -hmm. um, and that shellac got overcoated when this repair was done. So this piece that got broken off was broken, but the person that replaced it literally used the brad and nailed the part back onto the, the gun stock. Right, right. So it's been used. Well, having um, uh, one of the first things as a wooden objects conservator, I would look at is understanding the history, mm -hmm. uh, which can tell me all about use mm -hmm. and um, likely treatment. And so <clears throat> I'm looking at this, uh, it looks like oiled walnut to me. and. Uh, that it, uh, you can see everything from the scarring, these, all of these dark um, places in the, the scratches Correct, yeah. here, that's typically from an oil. Okay. All right. Yeah. So uh, that's can, can that's I show my you, first thought. Can I show you what the forearm looks like? Love to see. Because it. the forearm hasn't been. Oh, great. Used, okay? Great. Mm -hmm. So that is the original color. Uh, I'll here. take that. No, that is the original color. Well, that's a lovely color, isn't it? Isn't it? it? Yep. Hmm. You can see here where the finish is chipped here. And then the oils would have found their way right down into those so, chips. So when you say oils, <clears throat> oils from the hands or oils from It from could be both. Uh, for maintenance. Yeah. Um, but one of the problems that... Um, I've worked with oily wood, woods before. Teak is one of them. Rosewood's right, another. Right. I mean, there are a number of oily woods. Uh, I had a project years ago with um, a micro mosaic, and um, there I was holding that matrix. You've seen that before. Yeah, I have. But um, holding that matrix together, but there uh, you... I had oily woods. I had two rosewoods and a teak there. And um, I was using uh, animal hide glue, and one of the first concerns is, how are you going to hold this together? Because most glues don't want to adhere. They can't find their way in a couple cells to be able to hold this together. So um, when I look at something like this, 
and knowing that it has a it has a problem such as right mm -hmm. um, the first thing I think is we need to extract the oils which is what you did what with you, acetone right. yeah. so now it's going to be um, if I can put that back here so now examining where the problem is and um, I noticed here if I just squeeze that I can actually watch some movement and not that we're going to pry this apart but usually that sort of action of squeezing it um, it can act as a pump that's interesting so yeah. if if what I want to do in this particular, I think that's where we're talking? Yeah, right along the edge. Right along yeah. that edge. Uh, I brought some hypodermic needles, and here you can see, look mm -hmm. at that, you can see it right there as well. So we've got a compound break, really. It's heading this way and it's heading that way. So this particular part is uh, ready for failure, for certain. Yeah. And so, um, so I brought... Uh, a couple different gauges of needles, 23 and 25 gauge hypodermic needles with a couple different syringe sizes. And what we're going to do is we'll fill the syringe up with the acetone, we will inject, we're going to let it work. And then we're going to have a pumping action, we'll use cotton swabs and we'll begin swabbing it out as we go through the squeezing action. And we're going to keep doing this until I'm not seeing any residue. Okay. Whatsoever. Um, otherwise, you would have to break that, which yeah. is, you don't do that. I don't want to. It, right. So, um, otherwise, we're going to see failure. You could put glues in there and you will further complicate this problem. And so, eventually, when you glue that, you're probably going to put a clamp across that yeah. just to close the gap. But all the stuff that has made its way in there over time is what we need to remove. Right. All the oils, all the, uh, any, any... Accretions, they call it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Every, everything, yeah. everything that has found its way in there, other than the wood fibers, um, you're using epoxy probably for the gap filling. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, if you were to use something like a tight bond, which is not easy to reverse, by the way. Right. Okay. Um, some of these epoxies you can remove or back them out before they really cross-link with methylene chloride. And, uh, but you have only so much time, a month or two, and then it's, it it's doesn't fixed. work quite yeah. the same way. Yeah. Yep. So um, as a, a, a chemist who's a friend told me, oh, you can reverse everything. The question is, how destructive um, are you going to be in the process? Chemically destructive. We don't want to use, for instance, um, if you were to use something, in this case, that's a high pH. Think ammonia, which would discolor this. Think lye. Well, lye is used in paper pulp making. And it is known to take the lignin apart. Yeah, right. And so you're actually being destructive. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be non-destructive in this case. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to extract. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to share with everybody before before we go into the, the repair process, um, Mark is a is a um, world re renowned or recognized conservator uh, of antiquities mm -hmm. and antique finishes. Am I correct? I am. I wanted to really kind of share that with all of you. He's done. Mark has done work for some of the some of the larger or major museums in the country, Metropolitan. You've done mm -hmm. work for the Met. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also done work for some some higher end collectors. Uh, mm -hmm. um, Mark is definitely the guy that that is going to help me get through this pro uh, this project. So let's go ahead and talk about how we're going to fix this. All right. Okay. I came prepared and brought acetone. You've talked about acetone that you'd used, and we've discussed that about oily woods. I brought a couple things. Uh, this is a six uh, cc. Um, syringe, and uh, I have a 23 gauge needle. Uh, had I gone any smaller uh, than 23 gauge, um, the accretions we talked about would would plug this up. And I'm going to come in uh, at a couple different angles. I'll probably come in from the end. I'll come in from the top, and we're just going to very gently. 
I'm, I'm thinking some of these accretions may be acting as an adhesive okay. in here. And so as we do this, we're going to be just working this. And then these cotton swabs are, as we move this, then these accretions will start coming out. And I want to do this a number of times so that essentially this is clear. Huh? That's what I did when I cleaned the, the broken part. The broken until part. Until it was clear. All right. Love the smell of acetone in the morning. Oh, isn't it something? <laughs> you know, some of this I'd want to... Oh, wow. You'll actually be able to watch as we begin blotting this out. I can get, get where you can't get in another way. Now, later, as some of this, where I mean, we're just in the early stages here of loosening this up, but I can actually inject, and then I'm going to pull back, and you'll watch, it'll begin sucking up. You'll notice that the acetone in here begins, you'll actually see, it'll start getting dirty on you, too, and it's going to happen as we progress. Let's just see what we're doing here. There we go. And we're just beginning to extract. We'll do this a number of times. And as we do, you'll, you'll see, and I don't have a UV light with me, but you can under ultraviolet, um, depending on the fluorescence of this, right. just like you would with a black light, but you will see, if it were shellac, orange shellac, that would be a bright orange. Okay. If it's, if it's an oil, it doesn't fluoresce the same way. So, um, you talked about the Park Avenue Armory, uh, the Board of Officers room, we cleaned under ultraviolet for 12 and a half thousand hours. One room. We use some place around a half a million Q-tips, just to put it in perspective. So that's ridiculous, right? But it's true. Um, that's priceless. But it's just, it's the same thinking. So, so so you didn't use a belt sander. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. And if you hadn't been working at your with your former employer um, at the time, you would have been invited to come in and and uh, experience so much of that. Uh, the Park Avenue Armory is one of the greatest learning labs in the country. Um, there you're seeing things fairly untouched. And, um, and um, the first room we did there was uh, Company D, and it had 100 lockers. <clears throat> Just for my audience. Um... You've seen me talk several times about always doing a survey before you start doing any work. Yeah. And the the only time I got, I did get to go to the Park Avenue Armory with my, Mark. And one of the things, so what, the reason I had gone down with him is he wanted some help doing an initial survey. Mm -hmm. So I spent a couple days with him um, taking photographs, measurements, and and just a bunch of stuff. Before Mark even went in and did did one one yep. thing, so um, surveys are really important. Years before, because then, from from my findings, um, then we did a series of proposals, and ultimately every one of the conditions we saw was broken down spot by spot, right. spot with a a survey that was hundreds of pages telling us exactly <laughs> the treatment yeah. on those things. So here we're dealing with a problem. If you could imagine in the course of the veterans room or the board of officers, you may have 10,000 of these that you specifically come in. When you're dealing with something that's priceless, um, you know, here, the way you evaluated this and the client's desire to preserve this begins defining. The work that you do. Defining the work. Yes. Uh, so it's not a haphazard, not a haphazard thing. And again, I didn't use ultraviolet here today um, 
because, uh, well, frankly, I didn't think we were going to uh, go in at that level. But, and you've already defined, you know, what your goals were. I want to stick it together. Yeah, you want to stick it. <laughs> that's. A, well, I think you. I think you need to. Now, you want to give this a try? Yeah, sure. Okay, so you'll see. I'm continuing just to wet this because it is. Um, you see, yeah, I, it's coming can, out. Yeah, yeah, I can feel it on my fingers here. So I won't. I <laughs> squirted that out. But um, and then let's use this. Boy, that is absorbing it so fast. Absorbing the. Um, well, the the, the wood is still absorbing, and the so, acetone. Yeah, the acetone. Right. Yeah, exactly. Here, we already cleaned this once, and look at look at what we're getting. Right. Yep. There are other solvents we could have used to methyl out the ketone, which was uh, sort of a sister to acetone in terms of what it would do in this particular case. Um, but I didn't think of, I wouldn't be inclined to use in this particular case um, some of, I wouldn't use xylene, I wouldn't use toluene, I wouldn't, those don't occur to me as being able to solve this particular problem. This is actually spreading now. Yeah. Where it wouldn't spread. That's started. right. That's yeah, right. So. Yeah. So so that's so the what was happening is here you had the oils actually were acting acting as an adhesive. Okay. Right. Yeah. And as people continue to go through that. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and do that. So this is um, so this is a cleavage break, right? So just think of something that is being cleaved apart. And cleavage, cleavage um, we think of adhesives. Uh, so if we're talking about, at, um, let's say, Typon, for instance, it has to do with the type of splits. So you've got shear, mm -hmm. you have butt joints, you have all kinds of things like that. But a cleavage joint, a cleavage joint is a problem because it'll start here and it'll just keep walking. Right. Okay, so the more you can solve the problem here, the less stress is going to happen here. But you're gaining, let's say this hadn't walked yet, you're going to gain by knitting this together and coming back this by way. By walking, what, what is it? Well, th th that split, I mean, if, we, if you kept going, that would just Keep going, that's split. the walking. You're that's talking. the walk. That, okay. that yeah. split will just keep walking yeah. on you. Yeah. And so it is, there are actually, in the specification of these glues, they'll talk about cleavage strength. And it's this action right here. Because shear is like this. Right. Another factoid, type on glue, shear is like 3,200 pounds. Liquid hide glue, what's its shear? Higher. 18,000 pounds. Okay, it has a property that the others don't. However, subject to microbial attack. So that's why I would go down through the list of the adhesives I would consider. You've landed on the right one, right? But others... Epoxy. <laughs> epoxy. In this, in this case, it's, it's perfect for what you're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, you've got shock and everything else happening. Right. And so <clears throat> you've got to take all that into consideration as to how it'll function. Cool. So now how long would I want to keep doing this? I would, I, well, I certainly don't want to keep seeing this. So, so, right? so is it worth, is it worth doing a better job cleaning all of this stuff out before I, I continue I, this? I, I think I would. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Because I didn't, I spent a lot of time cleaning the outside, but I didn't well, spend a lot of time cleaning the inside of the end lighting. So let's, let's um, just take these on a swab here and let's just begin that process. Because that certainly will adulterate things as, as this is coming out this way, you can see. Right. Okay, and then what we haven't done, Bill, is we haven't injected from this side to get it to come out this way. Right. All right, we've only come in from the end. But the way, you know, we talked originally about how we're going to see a flexibility here mm -hmm. that is actually going to, you can see that? Look at that. And look right here 
I still have I still have acetone. You see it coming out? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So let's. So this is that pumping action. That's it's effective here. So let's look at it again. And I'm just going to keep squeezing. And when I do, I am looking. So that is coming from that crack right there. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. I would go. I would not be in a hurry to get this done. Um, we haven't discussed uh, to any real extent how long I would allow this to make sure this is totally evaporated and off-gassed out of there because um, some know this, but acetone is actually a thinner for epoxies. Yes, I know, because I use it to, right. when I try to wipe down the yep. and, and so in, in your cleanup. Yeah. So if we still had that in there, Epoxy okay. wouldn't want to set. Well, you're you're now saturating the cells to the point where the epoxy wants to go in mm -hmm. and hold those cells together. And instead, what we have is those are loaded with the solvent that would be doing. It's going to block you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we're trying to get these accretions out of those couple cells. Um, you know that these oils have saturated into the a couple cell yeah. cells deep, yeah. and so um, about an oily wood. This is not an oily wood, but it is a wood right now that is oily. Has, is oily, right? <laughs> and so I think of always in in dealing with rosewood or teak and other oily woods. I will clean it until I see no color come back out. And I have, but but the oils in the wood will want to migrate to that. Mm -hmm. And so I do that immediately before the glue job. And I know, though, that the solvent's gone. And then I do the glue job. Okay. All right. So, so, so let's say I'm happy with this. Mm -hmm. And I'm ready to, to get my epoxy in there. Yes. From the last of application in a crack like this, how long would it be reasonable to wait before doing the epoxy job? I waited a week on the on this this repair here. Oh, you don't need to. Not that long. Okay. No, I I, I would do it within a couple hours. A couple hours. If you wait too long, so I'm going to think of oily woods again, and and this it doesn't exactly apply, but just think about the principle of it. In oily wood. Um, it's going to, that oil is going to come back into what you cleaned. All right, so I want to keep that as clean as possible. I don't want oxidation. I, I have something clean. If I know that there are no remnants of that, this is a very rapid evaporator. Hmm? And so when it's clean and ready to go, I would say in a couple hours, I would Okay. Do. That sounds reasonable. Um, before I let you go, let's yeah. talk about this this larger crack that that actually goes down. It, you were right. It, well, let me get this. Yeah. So so you were right. It is sort of a compound, but it's also a break that goes down mm -hmm. through the center line, and you can see it comes all the way up into here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how would I? I, I assume I'm going to do it just the same way. Just just keep trying to inject mm -hmm. this into this. Right. Mm -hmm. I might try, um, and I'm going to use this here, you might be able to just slightly wedge it. So, so here, Bill, I might just try, I don't know if I can get that in there. I'm just slightly wedging it. Yep. Just ever so slightly. I mean, I'm, that's a pretty sharp point. I'm just going to, instead of hoping that the needle does it, I, I'm just assisting myself a yep. bit. Okay. So, you know guns a million times more than I do. Talk about the shock that's going to happen. <clears throat> well, one of the things, this, this is, so I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for this. <laughs> But this is a Damascus shotgun. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So this is not a, you, you know, you know what Damascus mm -hmm. is. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's wire wrapped around a mandrel mm -hmm. and, and then heated and pounded into a, into a cylinder. So this was black powder. Uh -huh. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so the black powder doesn't develop the pressures Got it. that a modern smokeless powder develops. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, it's not likely that the family's ever going to shoot this gun again. Sure. Mm -hmm. But it's my name going on the work. So right, I want right. to make sure that should this thing be fired, mm -hmm. uh, you can still fire them. There are actually groups and associations of, of shooters that actually take these old Damascus in good shape mm -hmm. and they continue to load black powder and mm -hmm. shoot them. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. is it possible that somebody could shoot this in the future? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do I expect it? No. This mm -hmm. family is going to end up putting it in a rack somewhere. And sure. Passing it generation to generation is my thought. Um, so, is there going to be recoil? Potentially, yes. So, mm -hmm. I need to do to be sure that if that recoil occurs, this thing's not going to come back apart. Right. So, for instance, in this repair here, mm -hmm. there's two brass pins. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that if that rec the recoil is going to be taken up here mm -hmm. and I'm probably going to relieve this this section just right. a little bit mm -hmm. maybe a thousandths or two so that, that there would be an imperceptible be gas transfer so it'd be transferred into this mm -hmm. larger area mm -hmm. and not here right but there are two brass pins in there that are that were designed to keep this in alignment mm -hmm. but also to absorb any potential recoil Got should it. the gun be be sure. fired sure this break what my plan is on this break there's supposed to be a panel here. You can see a little bit of the yes, remnants right, of it. Right, right, yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. But somewhere in this gun's history, this got, this got all, all sanded or something. Mm -hmm. So there is supposed to be a very sharp um, panel here, mm -hmm. a pointed panel. The panel's gone on both sides. I'm going to have to recreate them. Is that a metal panel? No, no, it's wood. It's, it's a wood it, panel. Yeah, okay. it, it was just carved into the wood. Ah, I see. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to ultimately end up doing, Mark, is I'm going to put this in the mill, and I'm going to mill this off mm -hmm. down so that it takes up about this much space. Okay. And I'm going to apply a new wood wood over. Ah, so you're going to sister something on and, there and try to re replicate that panel. Ah. The plan is once this is done, once it's glued, I am going to drill and counter bore. Okay. Put a brass wood screw in there mm -hmm. to hold this together. So you're going to have the epoxy. Then I plan to put a brass wood screw down into this section mm -hmm. to give this additional from, strength. From each side? No, just what I was going to do just, just from one side. side. Again, everything I'm trying to do is, mm -hmm. is to prevent this from coming apart mm -hmm. sometime in the future. So right. it'll be both epoxy and screw. So you might find this interesting. There are some chairs, beautiful little Hitchcock chairs, rare um, in its particular design, that somebody had cut the legs off, maybe three inches short. And that's what was wrong with the chairs. It was two of them. And so I began studying cleavage joints and how I was going to transfer all of the stresses. And um, you couldn't just flatten it and then add a piece on and hope a dowel is going to hold this together. Mm -hmm. So my client at the time, uh, out of New York City, uh, called me. I worked through the whole thing of how I was going to notch the joint and how if somebody sat, how it would tighten the joint. And then I had pins, um, such as, uh, and they were metal pins, so that the more weight that was applied, the stronger the joint got. Right. And, and so... Um, that's engineering, guys. Yeah, that's engineering. And, <laughs> and um, my client called and she said, those chairs just passed the test. There was a 350 pound man, wiggly man, sitting in the chair, and they're beautiful. But it was this very problem of how do you engineer where the, where the loads are being placed and how you're going to accommodate that. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, exactly. So everything. So, so the, the subtitle of the channel is Art, Craft, and Engineering. Uh -huh. because, there you go. Because you can't, you, you can't, you, not everything is art. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the artistic nature of this, the, the craftsmanship, uh, mm -hmm. we've talked about craftsmanship as a game of patience. Right, yes. Many times we've talked yeah, about absolutely. that. Absolutely. But at some point, 
when you're doing these kind of things, you've got to engineer it so that it stays mm -hmm. stays preserved, or stays conserved, or stays together. Mm -hmm. And so, Mark, I really appreciate it. And oh, my we'll, pleasure. We'll we'll continue to work on this. And if you guys have any questions for Mark, um, you can put them down in the uh, in the comments. And if when I get a chance, I'll throw them over to Mark. And maybe if Mark checks the channel. He can answer them directly um, on the uh, in the comments section of the yeah. uh, of the channel or of the video rather. Yeah. All right, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. If you enjoyed this, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Ring that bell so you get notified the next time I post a video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.